Good morning and welcome to our online service. We are Stony Creek Baptist Church located in Stony Creek, Ontario. And we are so glad that you could join us as we worship the Lord together. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace and love. We thank you for your strength. And on this Sunday of February 18th, we just rejoice in what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we gather in his name, we just pray that you would bless us, encourage us, and strengthen us in our most holy faith. So, Father, be with us now. And again, we stop and think of those that need that special touch this morning. God, you'd be with them in a very, very special and unique way. And just minister to them as only you can. For we ask these mercies in your son's precious name, in the name of Jesus, amen.
Well, we continue on in our series on the book of Nehemiah, and we are on the third chapter. And uh, we <laughs> it is one of those unique chapters in the Bible that you look at, and at first glance, you kind of wonder why God put it there. Lots of hard names to pronounce, lots of repetition, not much that would seem kind of relevant to us today, but that's only and I speak of myself, that's only my human limitations. God is wise beyond measure. 2 Timothy 3.16 rings out true here in so, so many ways that we really, when we really understand the nature of what's going on here, it is actually a gold mine of wisdom on leadership and human dynamics might not seem so at first, but as we look a little deeper into what God has given us by inspiration, we see the richness of this chapter. It is literally a manual of how to work together in the body of Christ. It's a manual, again, on organizational dynamics in general and how to define and direct really any um, enterprise. Really, when you want the best book on business dynamics, human dynamics, uh, relational dynamics, you need to look no further than God's Word. Than God's Word. I must admit that the names are difficult to pronounce, but I'm going to try in a minute to say some of them, and I will fail in the proper pre pronouncement of them. But uh, anyway... I just want us to remember how important names were in the Hebrew culture and how they defined people and groups of people and how important names are to God. It speaks on how important we are. We are to God, how significant each one of us is to him and how unique and special. Listen, my friends, how unique and special you are in his sight. So hang on as I share in a limited way just some of these verses to get us a kind of climatized or to, to uh, let us have a, a kind of a, a context here to work from in this sermon. And uh, we will move uh, forward from that. But as this chapter reveals so much about the man, Nehemiah, maybe it's one of the, as one commentator said, maybe one of the most important chapters in the book. And it is a dynamic chapter on leadership and how Nehemiah displayed that leadership in the building of the wall and the handling of the most important aspect of all in its construction, people. I've entitled this sermon, Managing Our Greatest Asset. And our greatest asset outside of God is what? People. People. So I read from verses 1 and 2. Elijah Hib, the high priest and his fellow priests, went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hanel, the men of Jericho uh, built the adjoining section, and Zakar, son of Imri, built next to them. And that's verses 1 and 2. And then reading from verse 24, Beyond them Benjamin and Hashab made repairs in front of their house, and next to them Azariah and son Messiah, and son the son of Ananiah made repairs beside his house. Azariah, I think. <laughs> anyway, and that's verse 24. And then a reading verse 30 and 31. Next to them, Meshuzalem, son of Berechiah, made repairs opposite his living quarters. And next to him, um, Melchijah, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs as far as the house of the temple servants and the merchants opposite uh, the in inspection gate and as far as the room above the corner 
and between the room above the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants made repairs. So I just want to mention these dynamics because you can see the uniqueness of what is recorded here. And when we start to look a little deeper, you'll see the great truths that are coming out in these verses of Scripture. So where do we start this morning? And again, there is so much that we could cover. We could do several, several sermons on this chapter alone, and we, we can't do that. We want to move on with the content of this book. But where we start this morning is where Nehemiah started, with a vision. He was, and there's three E's to remember this morning. He was enlightened. Enlightened. Solomon reminds us, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom, wisdom's instruction. Proverbs 29, 18 in the NIV. As we have alluded to in the opening uh, sermons, that... Um, God's name, if it was to once again be glorified and his people put in the right setting to renew their covenant with him and live to his glory, this wall, this wall had to go up. As someone has said, the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. And that's what we have Nehemiah doing here defining reality. Leaders have to see the big picture. Oh my, oh my, oh my. As my little grandson Luke would say, oh my. We have to see, leaders have to see the big picture. The reality was the city was in shambles. The temple, which is the Old Testament place God dwelt and where the people connected in worship and intimacy with him, could never function properly. It was without protection and significance. The moral of the people was low. People did not want to come and live here in this place. It was in great trouble and disgrace. Again, the book of Nehemiah tells us in chapter 1, verse 3. Idolatry, idolatry, which the central problem flourished, synchronistic religion was their portion and there was no hope for people in sight they needed this wall they needed this wall established to bring protection to the people and their spiritual freedom to set a context for the covenant renewal to proclaim as a witness to those around them the glory of God, and two, in reality, set the context when you stop and think about it for the future coming of the Messiah. It was a tall task. It was a tall task, but it all started with this wall. Nehemiah could see the crucial significance of the situation. Let me say that again. Nehemiah could see the crucial significance of the situation. And I believe in a way that was relevant to the people, he communicated that to them. That can often be a tough task, but a very, very needed and essential task of leadership. As one person has wisely said, Nehemiah was always asking God to provide a vision for him. He understood that a true vision must come from God. It must be God-inspired and God-revealed and a God-revealed vision. Only such a vision is worthy of leadership. So Nehemiah focused the foundation was this vision. He was enlightened by the Lord and went the way that God directed him in the construction and in the management, in the oversight of both the project, again, and of course, the people. The people that were so vital, so vital, such a vital resource to 
this project. And secondly, this morning, Nehemiah sought to empower. Nehemiah sought to empower. When you read over this chapter, you see that the construction of this mile and a half wall was broken down into what? 40 smaller segments. 40 smaller segments. Key. I'm going to give you several keys here. The big job was broken down into smaller segments that were manageable, that others under Nehemiah could direct. In other words, he didn't have to micromanage things all the time. For instance, the different gates we see in, in uh, 14 and following, we see different gates repaired by, for instance, a ruler of a district and his people. Or in verse 1, Elijah had, uh, mentioned the high priest and his fellow priests. There are 38 individuals and 42 groups mentioned in this chapter. Uh, some people view it differently uh, numerically, but we're going to go with that. 38 individuals and 42 groups mentioned. Incredible, isn't it? He, he designated leadership under him and also empowered the people, allowed them to make uh, the 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 reins it allowed them to to rein in their creativity not to micromanage not to micromanage so he put people in leadership and allowed them under him to set the leadership for other people so he didn't have to be there in one sense and he didn't have to micromanage and 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 do that dynamic he allowed the freedom for the people to move ahead with this project and their own wisdom and creativity. Also, it put things in the context for the people. It gave them a goal that was attainable and that was not beyond their reach. And that's so important that in leadership, those type of goals are set, which they could see the building every day. They could see it transpiring. So, so important. This was a key to this whole project being done. The way he set it up into smaller sections uh, with uh, leadership there to help guide the people that were involved in the project. And here's another key. Notice here all the different walks of life that are represented as you read through this chapter and the following chapters. Religious figures, jewelers, fine artisans, laborers, politicians, government officials, musicians, farmers, guards, perfume makers, old people, young people, male and some female uh, figures are, are mentioned here. Everyone pulled together. Everyone pulled together except the rulers of Tekoa. And actually the people of Tekoa said, hey, we ain't doing what they're doing. We're not going to do that. We're going to pull together with everybody else. It was just the leaders. And we'll talk about that a little bit down the road in, in, in a, a sermon probably that we'll discuss down the road uh, because they were kind of tied in with the troublemakers uh, politically. That's why I think. But anyway, they pulled together for the common good of the group. Common vision, common good. Common vision, common good. They were a team. They were a team. They had a common good and they had a common objective in mind when they were laying each one of these stones. I read this week about a horse pulling contest at a, a country fair. The first place horse uh, moved a, a sled weighing 45, 4,500 pounds. The runner up pulled uh, a sled weighing 4,000 pounds. The owners of the two horses wondered how much the animals could pull if they worked together. So they hitched them up and loaded the sled. To everyone's surprise, the horses were able to pull up 
and 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 pull 12,000 pounds 12,000 pounds Nehemiah united these people together and like these horses together they accomplish so much more than they could have done individually on their own together they worked as a team just like these horses and accomplished so much more it kept them focused even in the face of significant opposition and problems so important and another key as you read throughout this chapter you'll see phrases like next to him or next to them this indicates that the people in groups were strategically okay strategically placed by nehemiah he just didn't sound the starter pistol and say go get them guys and gals no no, everyone was where they were for a reason. People were given tasks that, that suited their interests, i.e. the priest, building of the sheep gate, religious significance. That would have been something very interesting to them. People were given sections of the wall in proximity to where they lived. That was very important. It would be of personal interest to them because it was theirs, their neighborhood, their family they were building for. Some went, <clears throat> and the same went uh, when uh, they needed to fight or they needed to be there to protect something. It, it was strategic there. They wouldn't have to run to another spot or be called to another spot. They were there in a strategic spot to defend their own homes, which they would have taken a personal uh, personal um, interest in. Their families were there. They wouldn't have to be wondering, running off, you know, what's going on with my family? Who's protecting them? It, again, these people were strategically placed to get the optimum, optimum potential and, and to, to, to have them uh, so that they, they were at ease. They were at ease in these strategic places. Uh, so it was so important. Uh, the people that came from outside the city, and there was people that came, as we read in this chapter, from outside the city, were given the pieces to construct where people had not populated as of yet. So everybody was placed in strategic uh, places that made so much common sense well thought out that's nehemiah following god's directive in god's plan with wisdom another key some of the wall was rebuilt some of the wall was repaired okay some of the wall was rebuilt some of the wall was repaired people were given different challenges in keeping with their abilities talents and gifts Nehemiah did not try and put a uh, square peg in a round hole. He looked at the situation, looked at the people, and gave them jobs that they could excel at and complete. Very instrumental. Another key. He was present in the situation and stayed on top of the situation. Again, he wasn't a dictator, but... He was there when they ran into problems, when they ran into uh, people giving them a hard time, different things like that, to adjust when they needed that adjustment. Leadership is not uh, uh, stagnant. It, it is a, a fluid process that you go through. Uh, nothing usually in leadership is going to go uh, really totally according to plan. So you have to ad adapt. You have to be able to adapt as you go, as you go. Maybe Nehemiah, I don't know, maybe he kind of worked on one section each day to stay in touch with the, with the workers, to communicate with them, to keep the vision alive to the people. And as I believe we will see in chapter 4, 
he knew that he had to get the wall up to a certain height quickly if they were going to survive. He could not be what we would term an absentee landlord. He had to be present. He had to be encouraging, so vital. And he had to keep that vision alive. Keep that vision going that we have talked about. Keep that vision. Keep the people focused. And keep the whole project, okay, the whole project moving ahead. I read this about some cannibals. Five cannibals got appointed as engineers in an oil company. During the welcoming ceremony, the boss says, you're all part of our team now. You can earn good money here and you can go to the cafeteria for something to eat. So don't trouble the other employees. The cannibals promised not to trouble the other employees. So four weeks later, the boss returns and says, you're all working very hard and I'm very satisfied with all of you. One of our cleaners has disappeared. However, do any of you know what happened to her? The cannibals disavowed all knowledge of the missing cleaner. After the boss has left, the leader of the cannibals says to the others, which of you idiots ate the cleaning lady? The hand raises hesitantly, to which the leader of the cannibals says, you fool, for four weeks we've been eating team leaders, task leaders, and project managers, so no one would eat, notice anything, and you have to go and eat the cleaning lady. <laughs> well, uh, they would have noticed if they'd eaten Nehemiah. <laughs> he would have left a, a large hole in what was going on. Yeah, for sure. Nehemiah, Nehemiah, an in-touch leader, an in-touch leader. And finally this morning, Nehemiah sought to encourage, to encourage. Nehemiah encouraged his people and by doing this taught them, modeled for them responsible behavior and leadership qualities and taught them. I believe, essential, very essential, ongoing things that they needed, relational skills that they needed to get the job done and be more efficient. Notice here, Nehemiah, when we think about these names, because these are Nehemiah's uh, memoirs, Nehemiah knew the people's names. He knew about them. He knew things like what they did, where they lived, uh, whether they had children, uh, who their extended families were, etc. He knew them on a personal level. He made it his business. <coughs> oh, thank you. That feels better. Thank you. And I'm sure they had lots of water there, too, when they were building the wall. <clears throat> I have a book in my library and it's on pastoral leadership and it's called They Smell Like Sheep. What an apt title. They smell, pastors smell like sheep, like they're sheep. Leadership should be born out of an understanding, the person that wrote this book, of the needs of those who would be affected by it. Leadership should be born out of an understanding of the needs of those who would be affected by it. And that's so very true. Notice here, he, he commends people continually. Continually. Nothing too big. There is one group that handled uh, 1,500 feet of wall. And then there was nothing too small, like fixing a gate or someone uh, went beyond and fixed things like uh, uh, pools, etc. Everyone was commended for what they did. Everyone was commended for what they did. Why? Because they were important. 
they were important. And listen, in Stony Creek Baptist Church, with our online congregation and with our in-house congregation, everyone is important. Everyone is important, vitally, vitally important. And also notice here the language in this passage. In fact, the whole book was simple and down to earth. Simple and down to earth. There were those, uh, <clears throat> there were those, those names of people that are hard to pronounce for somebody in, in our century, but in their context, in their culture, uh, it was Nehemiah getting down to basics with his people and encouraging them. He was a master, a master communicator. Uh, he entered the world of others, and that's what master communicators do. That's what Jesus did as the ultimate master communicator. He entered the world of others. He was a great listener. He uh, was observant. He was empathetic. He was teachable. And he was therefore effective. A young businessman had <clears throat> started his own firm. He ran a beautiful office and had it furnished with antiques. Sitting there, he saw a man come into the uh, outer office and wishing to appear like a kind of a hot shot, the businessman picked up the phone and started to pretend he had a big deal working. He threw huge figures around and made uh, giant commitments. Finally, he hung up and asked the visitor, can I help you? The man said, yeah, I've come to activate your, your phone lines. <laughs> yeah. Not such an effective communicator, eh? Yeah. And notice here, my friends, and this is a key to this gentleman, to Nehemiah, perseverance. We talked about this last week. We'll talk about it through the remainder of the, of the book because it is one of the central core values of this book and of this man. Perseverance. He hung in, in the face of opposition. And we'll see that in chapter four and on. In the face of problems, he leaned on God. He leaned on God. He stood strong in him and encouraged his flock and encouraged his flock to remain faithful and focused. Faithful and focused. And I'm sure he must have wondered from time to time, like, what's going on here? What's going on here? I'm sure he had his team of encouragers too. I, I think back to that night that after he had arrived and he'd, he'd gone out and looking around the wall at night, what he took a little group with him. Were those, I, I wondered, I've wondered as I've read that, were those his kind of personal closest allies or his team of personal encouragers? the Barnabases in his life. It is so important, my friends, that we all need to be Barnabases, sons and daughters of encouragement to one another. Do we have to be flamboyant? Do we have to be flashy? Do we have to be these dynamic people running around? No, we just have to be us and be sincere and do whatever we can do whatever we can to encourage one another, to encourage one another. Leading our most important resource, my friends, is what we see in chapter three. And that most important resource outside of God is us, is you and I, people. And you, and you and I, can be leaders in the different settings that God has placed us in the home, maybe on a team, at school, 
workplace, in church, maybe a small group, you name it, by remembering these dynamics that we've talked about this morning that Nehemiah teaches us. I started off this morning by saying how I didn't think at first this was relevant. Man, this is so relevant, so relevant to us today in 2024. It just speaks over and over and over again to us when we take apart the different pieces of the puzzle in chapter 3. We start off by being enlightened. To be a Christ-like student of the game of life. Listening to God. Listening to God. Listening to people. Learning how you can bring something positive to the table. It's an ongoing process as, as, we, as we learn, as we experience life, as we experience scripture, as we experience the presence of the indwelling Holy Spirit to empower us, as we experience relationships, all those different dynamics that, that help us, help us come together as people to what? be more Christ-like, and to glorify him. Enlightened, that vision, that vision that's based on God's wisdom as we apply it to life. And empowerment, how can we help each other succeed? How can we help each other succeed? T 20 times, Okay, 20 times in this chapter, we read the words next to him or next to them. How? That it points to the whole thing of, okay, we're, we're together. Uh, Ralph is working next to Sally, and Sally is working next to Bill, and Bill is, is working next to Jake. H how do we pull together as a team so that we all succeed together and like those horses, pull another third greater in what we can do on our own, more than a third. Uh, they, 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 they pulled two-thirds, I should say, more than they could on their own by pulling together, by pulling together. And then finally, encouragement. Encourage, encourage, encourage. May it be one of the catalysts May it be one of the catalysts that drives our life, your life, and my life, and the life of our church online and on campus. Be a Nehemiah. Encourage those around you. Again, encourage them with the assets, the talents, the different things that you have that are at your disposal. And it varies with all of us. We're not the same situations. We're not in the same context. That's okay. Look at this wall. Look at the people. All different walks of life, different contexts, different talents and abilities. But they came together to what? Encourage one another under the leadership of Nehemiah. And that's what the body of Christ is all about encouraging each other, even as the Bible says, we see the day approaching. We are to encourage one another. You know, it's interesting when you look at things on the internet, if you were to Google leadership and the qualities of leadership, and I did this and I, I won't go into them, it would have been interesting to run maybe one or two of those articles off. The different qualities, some of them list 11, some of them list 15, some of them uh, listed 9, uh, some of them listed 5. Uh, but it was it's just phenomenal to see the qualities that these people list today, both secular and religious uh, institutions or organizations, how it lines up with chapter three in Nehemiah's life. The very things that, that business people, that employers seek after are the very things that come out in chapter three that Nehemiah shows us 
that are so vitally, vitally important. Maybe if you take a moment and look and Google that up, you'll see the different dynamics, communication, uh, keeping people focused, uh, vision, uh, things like integrity, uh, hard work, teamwork, all these different things, uh, relational skills, all these different qualities that are so important to organizations and to uh, businesses are the very things that Nehemiah exhibited in chapter 3. People say the Bible isn't relevant. Well, they haven't read the Bible, have they? That's for sure. So God bless you, my friends. Keep encouraging one another and keep close to Jesus, the author and finisher of our wall, our faith. Amen. Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. God bless this message to hearts. Encourage hearts through this message. And help us in our relational skills, in our, the dynamics that we pour into organizations like the church, the home, different dynamics like that, that we pour in. Help us to be better builders of things, of people, of, of character. Uh, help us to be better builders of love, of the dynamics that Jesus would want us to build into the lives of each other. 
through his grace. So, Father, be with us now as we close. Encourage hearts, I pray, for we ask it in your Son's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, if the Lord should tarry, have a wonderful week. Have a great week. God bless you. See you next week.